Oh, so, okay, so picking up where we left off yesterday, um, let's talk a little bit about what was um, life like in these colonies that had been kind of accumulated by these industrial powers in their pursuit for resources and markets and, and nationalist pride. Um, and, and the first point obvious that that's probably pretty clear that you've seen from past um, history classes is that life in you know European colonies and British colonies and the Belgian Congo and French colonies and German colonies all throughout sub-Saharan Africa, South Asia, Southeast Asia, the loss of life and property could be truly devastating, right? And, and we'll look at the pictures here in a second and it turns your stomach and kind of hurts your soul a little bit. Um, but the reality is, is even as it was terrible and, and atrocity and devastation on like a almost unparalleled scale, there were some groups and individuals in um, the colonies um, that, that cooperated, right? That basically looked at the situation and saw, you know, the Maxim guns and the repeating rifles and the technology of these industrial powers and said, you know what, we're going to go ahead and surrender. Um, they told me if we did that, I could you know, stay in power, I would still keep my palace, I would still be super rich, and all I would have to do is answer to them. Um, and so, you know, cooperation wasn't unheard of, um, just as there was obviously some violent resistance, and surrender was not um, the norm always. Um, we did see um, that European powers oftentimes would co-opt citizens of their colonies um, and enroll them in the armed forces. Um, if and when we get to our World War I unit, um, there's quite a few pictures that you'll see where British soldiers are fighting um, in World War I battlefields um, with the British, right? Where West African um, men are fighting alongside the French um, or in regiments alongside the French. Um, we did see, like I said, that the elites, the people who had been, you know, the lords and the princes and the you know, whoever before um, the Europeans came over and took over, that they were able to keep much of their status um, and privileges, right? They, they stayed rich. They just answered to new bosses. Um, we also saw in the colonies kind of like what we saw in um, – Latin America in the first wave of imperialism, right, where spreading of Christianity became kind of a, a goal of imperial policies. We saw missionaries um, working, whether it's for the Church of England, right, or Presbyterianism or Catholicism, um, promoting European education um, and schools. Now, to be clear, um, just because they were promoting schools and education in the colonies does not mean that they were providing the full Western education, the classical education um, of advanced mathematics and sciences and things like that that we think of today. Only a very small class of of you know Sub-Saharan African, South Asian, Southeast Asian um, people would have gotten that. Generally, the sons of the the you know, the kings and the lords of those nations prior to European domination. Um, and, you know, in this place, right, for that very small class of Western educated Indians and, you know, South Africans, etc., cetera, um, the government of the colonial governments did rely on them increasingly over time. But the reality was, is that for all the rest that, you know, the Catholic missionaries and, you know, all the various Christian faiths um, would come in and build these schools, that the education was really limited, right, um, for all the rest. We weren't actually trying to make advanced, highly educated minds who could question um, and, and, you know, read. The education was really limited on how to get their primitive minds, I hope you could see my air quotes in my voice, um, their primitive minds ready to, to serve the crown, to serve the German people to serve the French people, right? We have, to, it's kind of the same premise that we heard um, in, from Ban Zhao a long time ago with Chinese women. Like we have to educate them so that they can, you know, serve us properly. 
But it is important to remember that as, you know, the Maxim guns and the repeating rifles and the steamships and the, all the industrial firepower went in, that while it was common for these nations and people to surrender, they did not roll over and take it lying down. Um, there were rebellions um, periodically, and by periodically, I mean semi-regularly. Um, most famously, and what our course is going to prioritize that, you know, um, is part of the AP World History Framework is um, something called the Sepoy Rebellion in India. Um, it's also known as the Indian Rebellion, aka the Indian Rebellion. Um, and it was basically um, the rebellion that broke out based on a variety of angry, like anger towards the British um, colonial powers. Um, but what set it off is actually an interesting story. It began as a mutiny amongst Indian troops that sort of lit the spark that uh, basically put India up in flames. Um, as we know in Hinduism, um, pigs or in Muslim, um, in Islam, right? Pigs are seen as unclean. They're unholy animals. And kind of in spite, to spite the Muslims in the British military, um, the British were using pig fat um, to grease the bullet cartridges in the weapons. And, you know, when the Indian troops found out, the Muslim Indian troops found out that they were being forced to use bullets that were greased in pig fat, which was um, seen as against God, um, that was a bridge too far. And what started as a massive mutiny um, ended up kind of, like I said, throwing India into flames as millions of Indians rose up with various grievances. You know, not everyone was mad about the pig fat on the bullet casings, um, but, you know, this this rising up of the Indian people to revive the, the, the dead Mughal empire and restore it to power. Um, this rebellion, kind of what we saw in Haiti, where, you know, what started as everyone rising up against the British quickly turned on each other with the Hindu and Muslim um, divide in India want, like widening as a result of this. Um, and the British, as a result, were less tolerant of the Indians um, after the rebellion was put down. We're going to see how this India's racial divide ended up leading to the partition of India in the 20th century into India and Pakistan, um, which was part of India up until World War II. Um, and it basically broke what we had talked about yesterday, which was the informal control of India, right, where the British were trying to rule it through taxes and economic policy rather than actually stationing British armies in India. Um, but after the Sepoy Rebellion, they realized that that was not going to work and that they really needed to directly control India, install a British governor, um, and not work through the Indian Rajas and princes and governors of those colonies. Um, and this was effectively the end of the British British East India Company rule, as the British Crown said, you know, we got to take a more heavy hand here. Um, we need to kind of get this under control. Um, you can see here what I'm talking about. The top left is um, this is um, German in Mozambique, a missionary school. Um, you can the bottom left is the aftermath of the Indian Rebellion. The Sepoy Rebellion is a just mass punishment. And then the picture on the right, the hauntingly disturbing um, image, um, is one from the Belgian Congo, um, which, you know, while none of the European powers um, were anywhere close to decent or human in their rule over the colonies, um, it's pretty well known that the Belgian Congo was far and away the, the most oppressive, the most violent, um, the most bloodthirsty. Um, the Belgian Congo was actually a personal, um, a personal colony of King Leopold II, meaning the colony of the Belgian Congo did not belong to the government of Belgium or to the Belgian people. It literally belonged to the king of Belgium, King Leopold II. And Leopold II, in his greed, basically set quotas on rubber production across um, the, the Congo rainforest where villages were given quotas that every week they had to supply X amount of rubber, where they had to go deeper and deeper into the rainforest to tap these trees and get the rubber needed to meet the quotas. And the punishment for not meeting the quotas um, was, um, first offense was the loss of fingers, as you can see on that man on the, the left. 
The second offense was loss of hands um, and feet and so on. And it got so difficult for the Belgian Congo or the Congolese uh, people to um, to secure the amount of rubber that the Belgian Congo government or the, the, the Belgium was requiring um, that they basically started cutting off, like capturing people, cutting off their hands and paying in hands instead of rubber and and you know the, the atrocity and the murder and the, I mean literally millions of people were killed not thousands but millions of people were murdered um, by King Leopold um, under his command and so you know looking at this aside from the really gruesome and, and disturbing and hauntingly racist and, and just awful conditions let's define historically how these um, new imperialist empires differed from older empires We've been talking about empires in this course since darn near when? August? Um, but we have obviously seen a progression in how empires act and how empires rule and um, in kind of their scope. And so how do these new imperialist empires differ from those? Um, number one, obviously we're seeing a, a more prominent role of race. Um, what was began in the Atlantic slave trade with the chattel slavery um, really widened racial divides around the world where othering was no longer based on religion of who was you know, Christian and who was not, but was based on, on race. And race became a prominent way of distinguishing the rulers from the ruled. Um, in previous um, classes, you know, we would have watched Lagan, right? Or, or Gandhi, um, and you would have seen this, but obviously the, the pandemic year is different, but race became a really prominent way um, where as a result of this, right, we, we want to restrict education um, to non-white people, right? It doesn't need to be said, but it should be said, and maybe you should think about it, that um, Western style education is power, right? Not Western style. Education is power, not Western style education. Let's be clear here. Um, and you don't want an educated people if you're trying to hold them down because more educated people are harder to rule, right? They're harder to control. Um, and so even, you know, the best educated native peoples of Sub-Saharan Africa and India and Southeast Asia very rarely ever made it to the upper ranks of the civil service in the, the colonial imperial governments. Um, racism was especially severe in areas with large number of European settlers. We're going to look at South Africa as a case study or would um, if we had the time. Um, where we looked at the the large Afrikaner and British population coming in and directly resulting in the apartheid regime that we see with Nelson Mandela that you might have heard of. Um, racism was especially severe in this area because the white European settlers, just like what we talked about in, in British North America, could effectively separate themselves from ever having to interact um, with the native people. Um, and you could just kind of oppress them because you don't have to observe directly their humanity. Um, we also saw that these new colonial states um, ruled their conquered people in their empires or in the colonies um, with, with much harsher rule. Um, it feels like we've been saying for months and months and months that the most successful empires in world history were ones that did not institute too harsh of rule, that let them keep their fashion, keep their religion, keep their belief systems, and they just had to pay a tax, right? And we talked about how, you know, historically, whether it was Genghis Khan or the Persians a long time ago, that when empires adopted this method of rule, it greatly minimized the resistance and rebellion of the people that they were ruling. But these new colonial states under, you know, the European industrial powers of Germany and France and, and England and Belgium, etc., um, really imposed really startlingly deep changes. Um, there was some good, although, you know, there's so much bad that it's barely worth mentioning, but hospitals, roads, railroads, schools, although, you know, questionable schools and racist schools at that, sanitation was brought to some of these more rural regions of India and Sub-Saharan Africa. But really, uh, again, mostly it was bad. Um, extremely high tax collection, collection um, changes in land holding laws, meaning like in South Africa, if you were black, you couldn't technically own land. You had to basically squat um, and you had to carry passes and go where they told you because you were not actually a citizen of the country. Um, they counted and classified their subjects and they 
you know, as we're going to see, they instituted racial divides because if you can keep people, you know, fighting amongst themselves, then they won't unify against you. Um, we saw in India the British appropriated the caste system as a way to separate people and play them against each other to keep them from uniting against them. We saw in Africa they identified different distinct tribes. 